Chapter Thirty Three of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Rider Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick Seventy Nine. Chapter Thirty Three, Isabel de Seguenza is avenged. For many years after the death of Guatemoc, I lived with Otomie at peace in the city of Pines. Our country was poor and rugged, and though we defied the Spaniards and paid them no tribute, now that Cortes had gone back to Spain, they had no heart to attempt our conquest. Save some few tribes that lived in difficult places like ourselves, all Anahuac was in their power and there was little to gain except hard blows in the bringing of a remnant of the people of the Otomi beneath their yoke, so they let us be till a more convenient season. I say of a remnant of the Otomi, for as time went on many clams submitted to the Spaniards, till at length we ruled over the city of Pines alone and some leagues of territory about it. Indeed, it was only love for Otomie and respect for the shadow of her ancient race and name, together with some reverence from me as one of the unconquerable white men, and for my skill as a general, that they kept our following together. Now it may be asked, was I happy in those years? I had much to make me happy. No man could have been blessed with a wife more beautiful and loving nor one who had exampled her affection by more signal deeds of sacrifice. This woman of her own free will had lain by my side on the stone of slaughter. Overriding the instincts of her sex, she had not shrunk from dipping her hands in blood to secure my safety. Her wit had rescued me in many a trouble, her love had consoled me in many a sorrow. Surely, therefore, if gratitude can conquer the heart of man, mine should have been at her feet for ever in a day. And, and so indeed it was, and in a sense is still. But can gratitude, can love itself, or any passion that rules our souls, make a man forget the house where he was born? Could I, an Indian chief struggling with a fallen people against an inevitable destiny, forget my youth and all its hopes and fears. Could I forget the valley of the Waveney and that flower who dwelt therein? And forsworn, though I might be, could I forget the oath that I had once sworn? Chance had been against me. Circumstances overpowered me and I think that there are few who, could they read this story, would not find in it excuse for all that I had done. Certainly there are very few who, standing where I stood, surrounded as I was by doubts, difficulties, and dangers, would not have acted as I did. And yet my memory would rise up against me, and time upon time I would lie awake at night, even by the side of Otomie, and remember and repent, if a man may repent of that over which he has no control. For I was a stranger in a strange land, and though my home was there and my children were about me, the longing for my other home was yet with me, and I could not put away the memory of that lily whom I had lost. Her ring was still upon my hand, but nothing else of her remained to me. I did not know if she was married or single, living or dead. The gulf between us widened with the widening years, but still the thought of her went with me like my shadow. It shone across the stormy love of Artemy. I remembered it even in my children's kiss and worst of all i despise myself for these regrets nay if the worst can have a worse there was one for though she never spoke of it i feared that otomie had read my mind heart to heart though far apart 
So ran the writing upon Lily's betrothal ring, and so it was with me. Far apart we were indeed, so far that no bridge that I might imagine could join that distance, and yet I could not say that we had ceased from being heart to heart. Her heart might throb no more, but mine beat still towards it, across the land, across the sea, across the gulf of death, if she were dead. Still, in secret must I desire the love that I had forsworn. And so the years rolled on, bringing little of change with them, till I grew sure that there, in this far place, I should live and die. But that was not to be my fate. If any should read this, the story of my early life, he will remember that the tale of the death of a certain Isabella de Seguenza is pieced into its motley. He will remember how this Isabella, in the last moments of her life, called down a curse upon the Holy Father who added outrage and insult to her torment, praying that he might also die by the hands of fanatics and in a worse fashion. If my memory does not play me false, I have said that this indeed came to pass, and very strangely. For after the conquest of Anahuac by Cortes, among others, this same fiery priest came from Spain to turn the Indian to the love of God by torment and by sword. Indeed, of all those who entered on this mission of peace, he was the most zealous. The Indian Pabas wrought cruelties enough when, tearing out the victim's heart, they offered it like incense to the Huitzel or Quetzal, but they at least dismissed his soul to the mansions of the sun. With the Christian priest, the thumbscrew and the stake took the place of the stone of sacrifice. But the soul which they delivered from its earthly bondage, they consigned to the house of hell. Of these priests, a certain Father Pedro was the boldest and most cruel. To and fro he passed, marking his path with the corpses of idolaters, until he earned the name of the Christian Devil. At length he ventured too far in his holy fervour, and was seized by a clan of the Otomi that had broken from our rule upon this very question of human sacrifice, but which was not yet subjugated by the Spaniards. One day, it was when we had ruled for about some fourteen years of the City of Pines, it came to my knowledge that the Pabas of this clan had captured a Christian priest, and designed to offer him to the god Tezcat. Attended by a small guard only, I passed rapidly across the mountains, purposing to visit the Kakik of this clan, with whom, although he had cast off his allegiance to us, I still kept up a show of friendship, and if I could, to persuade him to release the priest. But swiftly as I travelled, the vengeance of the Pabas had been more swift, and I arrived at the village only to find the Christian devil in the act of being led to sacrifice before the image of a hideous idol that was set upon a stake and surrounded with piles of skulls. Naked to the waist, his hands bound behind him, his grizzled locks hanging about his breast, his keen eyes fixed upon the faces of his heathen foes in menace rather than in supplication, his thin lips muttering prayers, Father Pedro passed on to the place of his doom, now and again shaking his head fiercely to free himself from the torment of the insects which buzzed about it. I looked upon him and wondered. I looked again and knew. Suddenly there rose before my mind a vision of that gloomy vault in Seville, of a woman young and lovely, draped in cerements, and of a thin-faced black-robed friar who smote her upon the lips with his ivory crucifix and cursed her for a blaspheming heretic. 
there before me was the man. Isabel de Siguenza had prayed that a fate like her own fate should befall him, and it was upon him now. Nor, indeed, remembering all that had been, was I minded to avert it, even if it had been in my power to do so. I stood by and let the victim pass, but as he passed I spoke to him in Spanish, saying, Remember that which may well be you have forgotten, father. Remember now the dying prayer of Isabella de Seguenza, whom many years ago you did to death in Seville. The man heard me. He turned, livid beneath his bronze skin, and staggered until I thought that he would have fallen. He stared upon me, with terror in his eyes to see as he believed a common sight enough that of an Indian chief rejoicing at the death of one of his oppressors. "'What the devil are you?' he said hoarsely. "'Sent from hell to torment me at last?' "'Remember the dying prayer of Isabella de Seguenza, whom you struck and cursed?' I answered, mocking. "'Seek not to know whence I am.' but remember this only, now and for ever. For a moment he stood still, heedless of the urgings of his tormentors. Then his courage came to him again, and he cried with a great voice, Get thee behind me, Satan! What have I to fear from thee? I remember that dead sinner well. May her soul have peace, and her curse has fallen upon me. I rejoice that it should be so, for in the further side of yonder stone the gates of heaven open to my sight. Get thee behind me, Satan, what have I to fear from thee? Crying thus, he staggered forward, saying, O oh God, into thy hand I commend my spirit. May his soul have peace also, for if he was cruel, at least he was brave, and did not shrink beneath his torments which he had inflicted on many others. Now this was but a little matter, but its results were large. Had I saved Father Pedro from the hands of the Pabas of the Otomi, it is likely enough that I should not to-day be right in this history here in the Valley of Waveney. I, I do not know if I could have saved him. I only know that I did not try, and that because of his death great sorrows came upon me. Whether I was right or wrong, who can say? Those who judge my story may think that in this, as in other matters, I was wrong. Had they seen Isabella de Seguenza die within her living tomb, certainly they would hold that I was right. But for good or ill, matters came about as I have written. And it also came about that the new viceroy, sent from Spain, was stirred to anger at the murder of the friar by the rebellious and heathen people of the Otomi, and set himself to take vengeance on the tribe that wrought this deed. Soon tidings reached me that a great force of Tlascalans and other Indians were being collected to put an end to us, root and branch, and that with them marched more than a hundred Spaniards, the expedition being under the command of none other than Captain Bernal Diaz, that same soldier whom I spared in the slaughter of the Nostrist, and whose sword to this day hung at my side. Now we must needs prepare our defence for our only hope lay in boldness. Once before the Spaniards had attacked us with thousands of their allies, and of their numbers but few had lived to look again on the camp of Cortes. What had been done could be done a second time, so said Otomie in the pride of her unconquerable heart. But alas, in fourteen years things had changed much with us. Fourteen years ago we held sway over a great district of mountains, 
whose rude clans would send up their warriors in hundreds at our call. Now these clans had broken from our yoke, which was acknowledged by the people of the city of Pines alone, and those of some adjacent villages. When the Spaniards came down on me the first time, I was able to muster an army of ten thousand soldiers to oppose them. Now with much toil I could collect no more than between two and three thousand men, and of those some slipped away as the hour of danger drew nigh. Still I must put a bold face on my necessities, and make what play I might with some forces as lay at my command, although in my heart I feared much for their issue. But of my fears I said nothing to Artemy, and if she felt any, she, on her part, buried them in her breast. In truth, I do believe her faith in me was so great that she thought my single wit enough to overmatch all the armies of the Spaniards. Now at length the enemy drew near, and I set my battle as I had done fourteen years before, advancing down the pass by which alone they could approach us with a small portion of my force, and stationing the remainder in two equal companies upon either brow of the beetling cliffs that overhung the road having command to overwhelm the Spaniards with rocks hurled upon them from above. So soon as I was able to give the signal by flying before them down the pass. Other measures I took also, for seeing that do what I would it well might happen that we should be driven back upon the city, I caused its walls and gates to be set in order, and garrison them. As a last resort too, I saw the lofty summit of the Teocli, which now that sacrifices were no longer offered there, was used as an arsenal for the material of war, with water and provisions, and fortified its sides by walls studded with volcanic glass and by other devices, till it seemed well nigh impossible that any should be able to force them while a score of men still lived to offer a defence. It was on one night in the early summer, having bid farewell to Otomy, and taking my son with me, for he was now of an age when, according to the Indian customs, lads are brought face to face with dangers of battle, that I dispatched the appointed companies to their stations on the brow of the precipice, and sallied into the darksome mouth of the pass with a few hundred men who were left to me. I knew by my spies that the Spaniards who were encamped on the further side would attempt its passage an hour before the daylight, trusting to find me asleep. And sure enough, on the following morning, so early that the first rays of the sun had not yet stained the lofty snows of the Vulcan Xhaka, that towered behind us, a distant murmuring which echoed through the silence of the night told me that the enemy had begun his march. I moved down the pass to meet him easily enough. There was no stone in it that was not known to me and my men. But with the Spaniards it was otherwise, for many of them were mounted, and moreover they dragged with them two coronades. Time upon time these heavy guns remained fast in the boulder-strewn roadway, for in the darkness the slaves who drew them could find no places for the wheels to run on, till in the end the captains of the army, unwilling to risk a fight at so great a disadvantage, ordered them to halt until the day broke. At length the dawn came, and the light fell dimly upon the depths of the vast gulf, revealing the long ranks of the Spaniards clad in their bright armour, and the yet more brilliant thousands of their native allies, gorgeous in their painted helms and their glittering coats of feathers. They saw us also, and mocking at our poor array, their columns twisted forward like some huge snake in the crack of a rock, till they came to within a hundred paces of us. Then the Spaniards raised their battle-cry of St. Peter, and lance at rest, they charged us with their horses. We met them with a rain of arrows that checked them little, but not for long. 
soon they were among us, driving us back at the point of their lances and slaying many, for our Indian weapons could work little harm to men and horses clad in armour. Therefore we must fly, and indeed flight was my plan, for by it I hoped to lead the foe to that part of the defile where the road was narrow and the cliffs sheer, and they might be crushed by the stones which would hail on them from above. All went well. We fled. The Spaniards followed flushed with victory till they were fairly in the trap. Now a single boulder came rushing from on high, and falling on a horse, killed him, then rebounding, carried dismay and wounds to those behind. Another followed, and yet another, and I grew glad at heart, for it seemed to me that the danger was over, and that for the second time my strategy had succeeded. But suddenly from above there came a sound other than that of the rushing rocks, the sound of men joining in battle, that grew and grew till the air was full of its tumult. Then something whirled down from on high. I looked. It was no stone, but a man, one of my own men. Indeed, he was but as the first raindrop of a shower. Alas! I saw the truth. I had been outwitted. The Spaniards, old in war, could not be caught twice in such a trick. They advanced down the pass with their coronades, indeed, because they must, but first they sent great bodies of men to climb the mountains under shelter of the night, by secret paths which had been discovered to them, and there on its summit to deal with those who could stay their passage by hurling rocks upon them and in truth they dealt with them but too well. For my men of the Otomie, lying on the verge of the cliff among the scrub of aloes and other prickly plants that grew there, watching the advance of the foe beneath, and never for a moment dreaming that foes might be upon their flank, were utterly surprised. Scarcely had they time to seize their weapons, which were laid at their sides that they might have greater freedom in the rolling of heavy masses of rocks, when the enemy, who outnumbered them by far, were upon them with a yell. Then came a fight, short but decisive. Too late I saw it all, and cursed the folly that had not provided against such chances, for indeed I never thought it possible that the forces of the Spaniards could find the secret trails upon the further side of the mountain, forgetting that treason makes most things possible. End of chapter 33 Recording by Patrick 79Chapter thirty four of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter thirty four The Siege of the City of Pines. The battle was already lost. From a thousand feet above us swelled the shouts of victory. The battle was lost, and yet I must fight on. As swiftly as I could, I withdrew those who were left to me, to a certain angle in the path, where a score of desperate men, for a while, hold back the advance of an army. Here I called for some to stand at my side, and many answered the call. Out of them I chose fifty men or more, bidding the rest run hard for the City of Pines, there to warn those who were left in garrison that the hour of danger was upon them, and, should I fall, to conjure Otomie my wife to make the best resistance in her power, till, if it were possible, she could wring from the Spaniards a promise of safety for herself, her child, and her people. Meanwhile, I would hold the pass, so that time might be given to shut the gates and man the walls. 
with the main body of those who were left to me, I sent back my son, though he prayed hard to be allowed to stay with me. But seeing nothing before me except death, I refused him. Presently all were gone, and fearing a snare, the Spaniards came slowly and cautiously round the angle of the rock, and seeing so few men mustered, to meet them, halted, for now they were certain that they had set a trap for them, since they did not think it possible that such a little band would venture to oppose their array. Here the ground lay, so that only a few of them could come against us at one time nor could they bring their heavy horses to bear on us, and even their arquebuses helped them but little. Also the roughness of the road forced them to dismount from their horses, so that if they could attack at all, it must be on foot. This, in the end, they chose to do. Many fell upon either side, though I myself received no wound, but in the end they drove us back. Inch by inch they drove us back, or rather those of us who were left, at the points of their long lances, till at length they forced us into the mouth of the pass, that is some five furlongs distance from what was once the wall of the City of Pines. To fight further was of no avail. Here we must choose between death and flight and, as may be guessed, for wives and children's sake, if not for our own, we chose to fly. Across the plain we fled like deer, and after us came the Spaniards and their allies, like hounds. Happily the ground was rough with stones, so that their horses could not gallop freely, and thus it happened that some of us, oh, perhaps twenty, gained the gates in safety. Of my army, not more than five hundred in all lived to enter them again. And perchance there were as many left within the city. The heavy gates swung to, and scarcely were they barred with the massive beams of oak, when the foremost of the Spaniards rode up to them. My bow was still in my hand, and there was one arrow left in my quiver. I set it on the string, and drawing the bow with my full strength, I loosed the shaft through the bars of the gate at a young and gallant-looking cavalier who rode the first of all. It struck him truly between the joint of the helm and the neckpiece, and stretching his arms out wide, he fell backwards over the crupper of his horse to move no more. Then they withdrew but presently one of their number came forward bearing a flag of truce he was a knightly-looking man clad in rich armour and watching him it seemed to me that there was something in his bearing and in the careless grace with which he sat on his horse that was familiar to me reining up in the front of the gates he raised his visor and began to speak I knew him at once. Before me was de Garcia, my ancient enemy, of whom I had neither heard nor seen anything for hard upon twelve years. Time had touched him indeed, which was scarcely to be wondered at, for now he was a man of sixty or more. His peaked chestnut-coloured beard was streaked with grey, his cheeks were hollow, and at that distance his lips seemed like two thin red lines. But the eyes were as they had always been, bright and piercing, and the same cold smile played about his mouth. Without a doubt it was Garcia, who now, as at every crisis of my life, appeared to shape my fortunes to some evil end and I felt as I looked upon him that the last and greatest struggle between us was at hand, and that before many days were sped the ancient and accumulated hate of one or both of us would be buried for ever in the silence of death. 
How ill had fate dealt with me, now as always. But a few minutes before, when I set that arrow on the string, I had wavered for a moment, doubting whether to loose it at the young cavalier who lay dead, or at the knight who rode next to him. And see, I had slain the one whom I had no quarrel, and left my enemy unharmed. "'How oh, there!' cried de Garcia in Spanish. "'I desire to speak with the leader of the rebel Otomy, on behalf of the captain Bernal Diaz, who commands this army.' Now I mounted on the wall by means of a ladder which was at hand, and answered, "'Speak on. I am the man you seek.' "'You know Spanish well, friend,' said de Garcia, starting and looking at me keenly beneath his bent brows. "'Say now, where did you learn it? And what is your name and lineage?' "'I learned it, Juan de Garcia, from a certain Donna Luisa, whom you knew in your days of youth. And my name is Thomas Wingfield.' Now de Garcia reeled in his saddle, and swore a great oath. "'Mother of God!' he said. "'Years ago I was told that you had taken up your abode among some savage tribe. But since then I have been far, to Spain and back indeed. And I deemed that you were dead, Thomas Wingfield.' My luck is good in truth, for it had been one of the great sorrows of my life that you have so often escaped me, renegade. Be sure that this time there shall be no escape. I know well that there will be no escape for one or other of us, Juan de Garcia, I answered. Now we play the last round of our game, but do not boast for God alone knows to whom the victory shall be given. Oh, you have prospered long, but a day may be at hand when your prosperity shall cease with your breath. To your errand, Juan de Garcia. For a moment he sat silent, pulling at his beard, and watching him I thought I could see the shadow of a half-forgotten fear creep into his eyes. If so, it was soon gone, for lifting his head he spoke boldly and clearly. This is my message to you, Thomas Wingfield, and to such of the Otomy dogs with whom you heard as we left alive today. The Captain Bernal Diaz offers you terms on behalf of His Excellency the Viceroy. What are his terms? I asked. "'Merciful enough to such persistent rebels and heathens,' he answered, sneering. "'Surrender your city without condition, and the viceroy, in his clemency, will accept the surrender. Nevertheless, lest you should say afterwards that faith has been broken with you, be it known to you that you shall not go unpunished for your many crimes.' This is the punishment that shall be inflicted on you. All those who had part or parcel in the devilish murder of the holy saint Father Pedro shall be burned at the stake, and the eyes of all those who beheld it shall be put out. Such of the leaders of the Otomy, as the judges may select, shall be hanged publicly, among them yourself, Thomas Wingfield, and more particularly, the woman Otomy, daughter of Montezuma, the late king. For the rest, the dwellers of the city of Pines must surrender their wealth into the treasury of the viceroy, and they themselves, men, women, and children, shall be led from the city and be distributed according to the viceroy's pleasure upon the estates of such as the Spanish settlers as he may select there to learn the useful arts of husbandry and mining. These are the conditions of surrender, and I am commanded to say that an hour is given you in which to decide whether you accept 
or reject them. And if we reject them, then the Captain Bernal Diaz has orders to sack and destroy the city, and having given it over for twelve hours to the mercy of the Talascans and other faithful Indian allies, to collect those who may be living within it, and bring them to the city of Mexico, there to be sold as slaves. Good, I said, you shall have your answer in an hour. Now leaving the gate guarded, I hurried to the palace, sending messengers as I went to summon such of the council of the city as remained alive. At the door of the palace I met Otomie, who greeted me fondly, for after hearing of our disaster she had hardly looked to see me again. "'Come with me to the hall of assembly,' I said. "'There I will speak with you.' We went to the hall, where the members of the council were already gathering. So soon as the most of them were assembled, there were but eight in all. I repeated to them the words of de Garcia without comment. Then Artemis spoke, as being the first in rank she had a right to do. Twice before I had heard her address the people of the Otomie upon these questions of defence against the Spaniards. The first time, it may be remembered, was when we came as envoys from Quitloha, Montezuma, her father's successor, to pray the aid of the children of the mountain against Cortes and the Tules. The second time was when, some fourteen years ago, we had returned to the city of Pines as fugitives, after the fall of Tenochtitlan, and the populace, moved to fury by the destruction of nearly twenty thousand of their soldiers, would have delivered us as a peace offering into the hands of the Spaniards. On each of these occasions, Otomie had triumphed by her eloquence, by the greatness of her name, and the majesty of her presence. Now things were far otherwise and even had she not scorned to use them, such arts would have availed as nothing in this extremity. Now her great name was but a shadow, one of many waning shadows cast by an empire whose glory had gone for ever. Now she used no passionate appeal to the pride and traditions of a doomed race. Now she was no longer young, and the first splendour of her womanhood had departed her. And yet, as with her son and mine at her side, she rose to address those seven counsellors, who, haggard with fear and hopeless in the grasp of fate, crouched in silence before her, their faces buried in their hands. I thought that Otomie had never seemed more beautiful, and that her words, simple as they were, had never been more eloquent. Friends, she said, you know the disaster that has overtaken us. My husband has given you the message of the Tules. Our case is desperate. We have but a thousand men at most to defend the city, the homes of our forefathers, and we alone of the peoples of Anahuac still dare to stand in arms against the white man. Years ago I said to you, Choose between death with honour and life with shame. Today again I say to you, Choose. For me and mine there is no choice left, since whatever you decide, death must be our portion. But with you it is otherwise. Will you die fighting? Or will you and your children serve your remaining years as slaves? For a while the seven consulted together. Then their spokesman answered, Otomie, and you, too, we have followed your counsel for many years, and they have brought us but little luck. We do not blame you, for the gods of Anahuac have deserted us, as we have deserted them, and the gods alone stand between their men and their evil destiny. Whatever misfortunes we may have borne, 
you have shared in them, and so it is now at the end. Nor will we go back upon our words in this the last hour of the people of the Otomie. We have chosen, we have lived free with you, and still free, we will die with you. For like you, we hold that it is better for us and ours to perish as free men than to drag out the days beneath the yoke of the Tule. It is well, said Artemis. Now nothing remains for us except to seek a death so glorious that it shall be sung of in after days. Husband, you have heard the answer of the council. Let the Spaniards hear it also. So I went back to the wall, a white flag in my hand, and presently an envoy advanced from the Spanish camp to speak with me. Not de Garcia, but another. I told him in a few words that those who remained alive of the people of the Ottomie would die beneath the ruins of their city like the children of Tenochtitlan before them, but that while they had a spear to throw and an arm to throw it, they would never yield to the tender mercies of the Spaniard. The envoy returned to the camp, and with an hour the attack began. Bringing up the pieces of ordnance, the Spaniards set them within little more than a hundred paces of the gates, and began to batter us with iron shot at their leisure, for our spears and arrows could scarcely harm them at such a distance. Still we were not idle, for seeing that the wooden gates must soon be down, we demolished houses on either side of them, and filled up the roadway with stones and rubbish. At the rear of the heap thus formed, I caused a great trench to be dug, which could not be passed by horsemen and ordnance till it was filled in again. All along the main street leading to the great square of the Teocli, I threw up other barricades, protected in the front and the rear by dikes, cut through the roadway, and in the case the Spaniards should try to turn our flank and force a passage through the narrow and tortuous lanes to the right and left, I also barricaded the four entrances to the great square or market-place. Till nightfall, the Spaniards bombarded the shattered remains of the gates, and the earthworks behind them, doing no great damage beyond the killing of about a score of people by cannon-shot and arquebus balls But they attempted no assault that day, at length the darkness fell, and their fire ceased, but not so our labours. Most of the men must guard the gates and the weak spots in the walls, and therefore the building of the barricades was left chiefly to the women, working under my command and that of my captains. Otomie herself took a share in the toll, an example that was followed by every lady and indeed by every woman in the city, and there were many of them, for the women outnumbered the men among the Otomi, and moreover not a few of them had been made widows on that same day. It was a strange sight to see them in the glare of hundreds of torches split from the resin pine that gave its name to the city, as all night long they moved to and fro in lines, each of them staggering beneath the weight of a basket of earth, or heavy stone, or dug with wooden spades at the hard soil, or laboured at the pulling down of houses. They never complained, but worked on sullenly and despairingly. No groan or tear broke from them, no, not even from those whose husbands and sons had been hurled that morning from the precipices of the pass. They knew that resistance would be useless, and that their doom was at hand. But no cry arose among them of surrender to the Spaniards. Those of them who spoke of the matter at all said with Otomi that it was better to die free than to die as slaves. But the most did not speak. The old and the young, mother, wife, and widow, and maid, they laboured in silence, 
and the children laboured at their sides. Looking at them, it came into my mind that these silent, patient women were inspired by some common and desperate purpose that all knew of, but which none of them chose to tell. "'Will you work so hard for your masters, the tools?' cried a voice in bitter mockery, as a file of them toiled past beneath their loads of stones. "'Fool!' answered the leader, a young and lovely lady of rank. "'Do the dead labour? "'Nay,' said the ill jester, "'but such as you are too fair for the tools to kill, "'and your years of slavery will be many. "'Say, how shall you escape them?' "'Fool!' answered the lady again. "'Does fire die from lack of fuel only, "'and must every man live till age takes him? "'We shall escape them thus.' "'And casting down the torch she carried, "'she trod it into the earth with her sandal, "'and went on with her load. "'Then I was sure that they had some purpose, "'though I did not guess how desperate it was, "'and Otomy would tell me nothing of this woman's secret. Otomy, I said to her that night, "'when we met by chance, "'I have ill news for you. "'It must be bad indeed, husband, "'to be so named in such an hour,' she answered. "'De Garcia is among our foes.' "'I knew it, husband. "'Well, how did you know it?' "'By the hate written in your eyes,' she answered. "'It seems that his hour of triumph is at hand,' I said. "'Nay, beloved, not his, but yours. "'You shall triumph over de Garcia, "'but victory will cost you dear. "'I know it in my heart. "'Ask me not how or why.' See, the queen puts on her crown, and she pointed to the Vulcan Xhaka, whose snows grew rosy with the dawn. And you must go to the gate, for the Spaniards will soon be stirring. As Otomy spoke, I heard a trumpet blare without the walls. Hurrying to the gates by the first light of day, I could see that the Spaniards were mustering their forces for attack. They did not come at once, however, but delayed till the sun was well up. Then they began to pour a furious fire upon the defences that reduced the shattered beams of the gates to powder and even shook down the crest of the earthwork beyond them. Suddenly the firing ceased and again a trumpet called. Now they charged us in a column, a thousand or more Tlaxcalans leading the van followed by the Spanish force. In two minutes I who awaited them beyond it, together with some three hundred warriors of the Otomy, saw their heads appear over the crest of the earthwork, and the fight began. Thrice we drove them back with our spears and arrows, but at the fourth charge the wave of men swept over our defence and poured into the dry ditch beyond. Now we were forced to fly to the next earthwork, for we could not hope to fight so many in the open street. With us, so soon as a passage had been made for their horse and ordnance, the enemy followed us. Here the fight was renewed, and this barricade being very strong, we held it for hard upon two hours, with much loss to ourselves and to the Spanish force. Again, we retreated, and again we were assailed, and so the struggle went on throughout the live-long day. Every hour our numbers grew fewer, and our arms fainter, but still we fought on desperately. At the last two barricades, hundreds of the women of the Otomy fought by the sides of their husbands and their brothers. The last earthwork was captured by the Spaniards, just as the sun sank, and under the shadow of the approaching darkness those of us that remained alive fled to the refuge which we had prepared upon the Teocalli. 
nor was there any further fighting during that night. End of chapter 34 Recording by Patrick 79Chapter thirty five of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter thirty five The Last Sacrifice of the Women of the Otomy. Here in the courtyard of the Teocli, by the light of the burning houses, for as they advanced the Spaniards fired the town, we mustered our array, to find that there were left to us, in all, some four hundred fighting men, together with a crowd of nearly two thousand women and children. Now, although this Teocli was not quite so lofty as that of the great temple of Mexico, its sides were steeper, and everywhere laced with dressed stone and the open space upon its summit was almost as great, measuring indeed more than a hundred paces every way. This area was paved with blocks of marble, and in its centre stood the temple of the war-god, where the statue still sat, although no worship had been offered to him for many years, the stone of sacrifice, the altar of fire, and the storehouses of the priests. Moreover, in front of the temple, and between it and the stone of sacrifice, was a deep cemented hole, the size of a large room, which once had been used as the place for the safe keeping of the grain in times of famine. This pit I had caused to be filled with water, borne with great toil to the top of the pyramid, and in the temple itself I stored a great quantity of food so that we had no cause to fear present death from thirst or famine. But now we were face to face with a new trouble. Large as was the summit of the pyramid, it would not give shelter to a half of our numbers, and if we desired to defend it, some of the multitude herded round its base must seek refuge elsewhere. Calling the leaders of the people together, I put the matter before them in a few words, leaving them to decide what must be done. They in turn consulted amongst themselves, and at length gave me this answer, that it was agreed that all the wounded and aged there, together with most of the children, and with them any others who wished to go, should leave the Teocli that night, to find their way out of the city if they could, or if not, to trust to the mercy of the Spaniards. I said it was well, for death was on every side, and it mattered little which way men turned to meet it. So they were sorted out, fifteen hundred or more of them, and at midnight the gates of the courtyard were thrown open, and they left. Oh, it was dreadful to see the farewells that took place in that hour. Here a daughter clung to the neck of her aged father. Here husbands and wives bade each other a last farewell. Here mothers kissed their little children, and on every side rose up the sounds of bitter agony, the agony of those who parted for ever. I buried my face in my hands, wondering, as I had often wondered before, how a God whose name is Mercy can bear to look upon sights that break the hearts of sinful men to witness. Presently I raised my eyes and spoke to Otomy, who was at my side, asking her if she would not send our son away with the others passing him off for some child of common people. Nay, husband, she answered. It is better for him to die with us than to live as a slave of the Spaniards. At length it was over, and the gates had shut behind the last of them. 
soon we heard the distant challenge of the spanish sentries as they perceived them and the sound of shots followed by cries oh doubtless the talascans are massacring them i said but it was not so when a few had been killed the leaders of the spaniards found that they waged war upon an unarmed mob made up of the most part of aged people women and children and their commander bernal diaz a merciful man if a rough one ordered that the onslaught should cease indeed he did more for when all the able-bodied men together with such children as were sufficiently strong to bear the fatigues of travel had been sorted out to be sold as slaves he suffered the rest of that melancholy company to depart whither they would and so they went though what became of them i do not know that night we spent in the courtyard of the teocli but before it was light i caused the women and children who remained with us perhaps some six hundred in all for very few of the former who were unmarried or who were married were still young and comely had chosen to desert our refuge to ascend the pyramid guessing that the spaniards would attack us at dawn i stayed however with three hundred fighting men that were left to me a hundred or more having thrown themselves upon the mercy of the spaniards with the refugees to await the spanish onset under shelter of the walls of the courtyard at dawn it began and by midday do what we could to stay it the wall was stormed and leaving nearly a hundred dead and wounded behind me i was driven to the winding way that led to the summit of the pyramid here they assaulted us again but the road was steep and narrow and their numbers gave no great advantage on it so that the end of it was that we beat them back with loss and there was no more fighting that day the night which followed we spent upon the summit of the pyramid and for my part i was so weary that after i had eaten i never slept more soundly next morning the struggle began anew and this time with better success to the spaniards inch by inch under cover of the heavy fire from the arquebuses and pieces they forced us upwards and backward all day long the fight continued upon the narrow road that wound from stage to stage of the pyramid at length as the sun sank a company of our foes their advance guard with shouts of victory emerged upon the flat of the summit and rushed towards the temple in its centre all this while the women had been watching but now one of them sprang up crying with a loud voice seize them they are but a few then with a fearful scream of rage the mob of women cast themselves upon the weary spaniards and talascans bearing them down by the weight of their numbers many of them were slain indeed but in the end the women conquered ay and made their victims captive fastening them with cords to the rings of copper that were let into the stones of the pavement to which in former days those doomed to sacrifice had been secured when their numbers were so great that the priests feared lest they should escape i and the soldiers with me watched this sight wondering then i cried out what men of the otomie shall it be said that our women outdid us in courage and without further ado followed by a hundred or more of my companions i rushed desperately down the steep and narrow path at the first corner we met the main array of spaniards and their allies coming up slowly for now they were sure of victory and so great was the shock of our encounter that many of them were hurled over the edge of the path to roll down the steep sides of the pyramid seeing the fate of their comrades those behind them halted then began to retreat presently the weight of our rush struck them also and they in turn pushed upon those below till at length panic seized them and with a great crying 
the long line of men that wound round and round the pyramid from its base almost to its summit sought safety in flight but some of them found none for the rush of those above pressing with ever-increasing force upon their friends below drove many to their death since here on the pyramid there was nothing to cling to and if once a man lost his foothold on the path his fall was broken only when his body reached the court beneath thus in fifteen short minutes all that the spaniards had won this day was lost again for except the prisoners at its summit none of them remained alive upon the teocalli indeed so great a terror took them that bearing with them their dead and wounded they retreated under cover of the night to their camp without the walls of the courtyard oh now weary but triumphant we wended back towards the crest of the pyramid but as i turned the corner of the second angle that was perhaps nearly one hundred feet above the level of the ground a thought struck me and i set those with me a task loosening the blocks of stone that formed the edge of the roadway we rolled them down the sides of the pyramid and so laboured on removing layer upon layer of stones and of the earth beneath till where the path had been was nothing but a yawning gap thirty feet or more in width now i said surveying our handiwork by the light of the rising moon that spaniard who would win our nest must first find wings to fly with i too answered one at my side but say what wings shall we find the wings of death i said grimly and went on my upward way it was near midnight when i reached the temple for the labour of levelling the road took many hours and food had been sent to us from above as i drew nigh i was amazed to hear the sound of solemn chanting and still more was i amazed when i saw that the doors of the temple of huitzel were open and that the sacred fire which had not shone there for many years once more flared fiercely upon his altar i stood still listening did my ears trick me or did i hear the dreadful sound of sacrifice nay again its wild refrain rang out upon the silence to thee we sacrifice save us huitzel huitzel lord god i rushed forward and turning the angle of the temple i found myself face to face with the past for there as in bygone years were the pabas clad in their black clothes their long hair hanging about their shoulders their dreadful knife of glass fixed in their girdles there to the right of the stone of sacrifice were those destined to the god and there being led towards it was the first victim a talascan prisoner his limbs held by men clad in dress of priest near him arrayed in the scarlet robe of sacrifice stood one of my captains who i remembered had once served as a priest of tescat before idolatry was forbidden in the city of pines and around were a wide circle of women that watched and from whose lips swelled the awful chant now i understood it all in their last despair maddened by the loss of fathers husbands and children by their cruel fate and standing face to face with certain death the fire of the old faith had burnt up in their savage hearts there was the temple there were the stone and implements of sacrifice and there on the hands were the victims taken in war they would glut a last revenge they would sacrifice to their fathers gods as their fathers had done before them and the victims should be taken from their own victorious foes ay they must die but at least they would seek the mansions of the sun 
made holy by the blood of the accursed Tule. I have said that it was the women who sang this chant and glared so fiercely upon their victims, but I have not yet told you all the horror of what I saw, for in the forefront of their circle, clad in white robes, the necklet of great emeralds, Guatemoc's gift, flashing upon her breast, the plumes of royal green set in her hair, giving the time of the death chant with a little wand, stood Montezuma's daughter, Artemy, my wife. Never had I seen her look so beautiful or so dreadful. It was not Artemy whom I saw, for where was the tender smile, and where the gentle eyes? Here before me was a living vengeance wearing the shape of woman. In an instant I guessed the truth, though I did not know it all. Artemy, who, although she was not of it, had ever favoured the Christian faith, Artemy, who for years had never spoken of these dreadful rites except with anger, whose every act was love and whose every word was kindness, was still in her soul an idolater and a savage. She had hidden this side of her heart from me well through all these years. Perchance she herself had scarcely known its secret, for but twice I had seen anything of the buried fierceness of her blood. The first time was when Marina had brought her a certain robe in which she might escape from the camp of Cortes, and she had spoken to Marina of that robe. And the second, when on this same day she had played her part to the Talascan, and had struck him down with her own hand as he bent over me. All this, and much more, passed through my mind in that brief moment, while Otomy marked the time of the death chant, and the Pabas dragged the Talascan to his doom. The next I was at her side. "'What passes here?' I asked sternly. Otomy looked on me with a cold wonder, and empty eyes, as though she did not know me. "'Go back, white man,' she answered. "'It is not lawful for strangers to mingle in our rites.' Oh, I stood bewildered, not knowing what to do, while the flame burned and the chant went up before the effigy of Whitzel, of the demon Whitzel, awakened after many years of sleep. Again and yet again the solemn chant arose, Artemy beating time with her little rod of ebony, and again and yet again the cry of triumph rose to the silent stars. Now I awoke from my dream, for as an evil dream it seemed to me, and drawing my sword I rushed towards the priest at the altar to cut him down. But though the men stood still, the women were too quick for me. Before I could lift the sword, before I could even speak a word, they had sprung upon me like jaguars of their own forest, and like jaguars they hissed and growled into my ears. "'Get you gone, Tule,' they said, "'lest we stretch you on the stone with your brethren.' And still hissing, they pushed me thence. I drew back, and thought for a while in the shadow of the temple. My eye fell upon the long line of victims awaiting their turn of sacrifice. There were thirty and one of them still alive, and of these five were Spaniards. I noticed that the Spaniards were chained the last of all the line. It seemed that the murderers would keep them till the end of the feast. Indeed, I discovered that they were all to be offered up at the rising of the sun. How could I save them, I wondered. My power was gone. The women could not be moved from their work of vengeance. They were mad with their sufferings. As well might a man try to snatch her prey from a puma robbed of her whelps as to turn them from their purpose. With the men it was otherwise, however. 
Some of them mingled in the orgy, indeed, but more stood aloof, watching with a fearful joy the spectacle in which they did not share. Near me was a man, a noble of the Otomy, of something more of my own age. He had always been my friend, and after me he commanded the warriors of the tribe. I went to him and said, Friend, for the sake of the honour of your people, help me to end this. I cannot, Teule, he answered, and beware how you meddle in the play, for none will stand by you. Now the women have power, and you see they use it. They are about to die, but before they die they will do as their fathers did, for their strait is sore, and though they have been put aside, the old customs are not forgotten. At least can we not save the Teules, I answered. Why should you wish to save the Teules? Will they save us some few days hence, when we are in their power? Well, perhaps not, I said. But if we must die, let us die clean from this shame. What then do you wish me to do, Teule? This, I would have you find some three or four men who are not fallen into this madness, and with them aid me to loose the Teules, for we cannot save the others. If this may be done, surely we can lower them with ropes from the point where the road is broken away, down to the path beneath and thus they may escape to their own people. I will try, he answered, shrugging his shoulders, not from any tenderness towards the accursed Teules, whom I could well bear to see stretched upon the stone, but because it is your wish, and for the sake of the friendship between us. Then he went, and presently I saw several men place themselves as though by chance, between the spot where the last of the line of Indian prisoners and the first of the Spaniards were made fast, in such a fashion as to hide them from the sight of the maddened women, engrossed as they were in their orgies. Now I crept up to the Spaniards. They were squatted upon the ground, bound by their hands and feet to the copper rings in the pavement. There they sat silently awaiting the dreadful doom, their faces grey with terror, and their eyes starting from their sockets. Sst! I whispered in Spanish into the ear of the first, an old man whom I knew as one who had taken part in the wars of Cortes. Would you be saved? He looked up quickly, and said in a hoarse voice, Who, who are you that talk of saving us? Who can save us from these she-devils? I am a Teule, a man of white blood, and a Christian, and alas, I must say it, the captain of this savage people. With the aid of some few men who are faithful to me, I purpose to cut your bonds, and afterwards you shall see. No, Spaniard, that I do this at great risk, for if we are caught, it is a chance that I myself shall have to suffer those things from which I hope to rescue you. How be assured, Teule, answered the Spaniard, that if we should get safe away, we shall not forget this service. Save our lives now, and the time may come when we shall pay you back with yours. But even if we are loosed, how can we cross the open space in this moonlight? and escape the eyes of those furies. We must trust to chance for that, I answered, and as I spoke, fortune helped us strangely, for by now the Spaniards in their camp below had perceived what was going forward to the crest of the Teocalli. A yell of horror rose from them, and instantly they opened fire upon us with their pieces and arquebuses, though because of the shape of the pyramid and their position beneath it, the storm of shot swept over us, doing us little or no hurt. Also, a great company of them poured across the courtyard, hoping to storm the temple, for they did not know the road had been broken away. Now, though the rites of sacrifice never ceased, what with the roar of the cannon, the shouts of rage and terror from the Spaniards, 
and the hiss of musket balls and the crackling of fire from houses which they had fired to give them more light and the sound of chanting the turmoil and confusion grew so great as to render the carrying out of my purpose easier than i hoped by this time my friend the captain of the otomie was at my side and with him several men who he could trust stooping down with a few swift blows of a knife i cut the ropes which bound the spaniards then we gathered ourselves into a knot oh, twelve or more of us and in the centre of the knot we set the five spaniards this done i drew my sword and cried the tules storm the temple which was true for already their line was rushing up the winding path the tules storm the temple i go to stop them and straight away we sped across the open space none saw us or if they saw us none hindered us for all the company were intent upon the consummation of a flesh sacrifice moreover the tumult was such as i afterwards discovered that we were scarcely noticed two minutes passed and our feet were set upon the winding way and now i breathed again for we were beyond the sight of the women on we rushed swiftly as the cramped limbs of the spaniards could carry them till presently we reached the at angle of the path where the breach began the attacking spaniards had already come to the further side of the gap for though we could not see them we could hear their cries of rage and despair as they halted helplessly and understood that their comrades were beyond their aid now we are sped said that spaniard with whom i had spoken the road is gone and it must be certain death to try the other side of the pyramid not so i answered some fifty feet below the path still runs and one by one we will lower you to it with this rope then we set to work making the cord fast beneath the arms of a soldier and let him down gently till he came to the path and was received there by his comrades as a man returned from the dead the last to be lowered was that spaniard with whom i had spoken farewell he said and may the blessings of god be on you for this act of mercy renegade though you are say now will you not come with me i set my life and honour to pledge for your safety you tell me that you are still a christian man is that a place for christians and he pointed upwards no indeed i answered but still i cannot come for my wife and son are there and i must return to die with them if need be if you bear me any gratitude strive to return to save their lives since for my own i care but little that i will he said and then we let him down among his friends whom he reached in safety now we returned to the temple giving it out that the spaniards were in retreat having failed to cross the breach of the roadway here before the temple the orgy still went on but two indians remained alive and the priests of sacrifice grew weary where are the tules cried a voice swift strip them for the altar but the tules were gone nor search where they would could they find them their god has taken them beneath his wing i said speaking from the shadow in a feigned voice their god has taken them beneath his wings i said speaking from the shadow in a feigned voice wheatsel cannot prevail before the gods of the tules then i slipped aside so that none knew it was i who had spoken but the cry was up and echoed far and wide the god of the christians has hidden them beneath his wing let us make merry with those whom he rejects said the cry and the last of the captives were dragged away now i thought that all was finished but this was not so 
I have spoken of the secret purpose which I read in the sullen eyes of the Indian women, as we laboured on the barricades, and I was about to see its execution. Madness still burned in the hearts of these women. They had accomplished their sacrifice, but their festival was still to come. They drew themselves away to the further side of the pyramid, and, heedless of the shots which now and again pierced the breast of one of them, for here they were exposed to the Spanish fire, remained a while in preparation. With them went the priests of sacrifice, but now, as before, the rest of the men stood in sullen groups, watching what befell, but lifting no hand or voice to hinder its hellishness. One woman did not go with them, and that woman was Otomie, my wife. She stood by the stone of sacrifice. Oh, a piteous sight to see, for her frenzy, or rather her madness, had outworn itself, and she was as she had ever been. There stood Otomie, gazing with wide and horror-stricken eyes now at the tokens of this unholy rite, and now at her own hands, as though she thought to see them red, and shuddered at the thought. I drew near to her and touched her on the shoulder. She turned swiftly, gasping, "'Husband! Oh, husband!' "'It is I,' I answered, "'but call me husband no more.' "'Oh, what have I done?' she wailed, and fell senseless in my arms. And here I will add what at that time I knew nothing of, for it was told me in after years by the rector of this parish, a very learned man, though one of very narrow mind. Had I known it indeed, I should have spoken more kindly to Otomie, my wife, even in that hour, and thought more gently of her wickedness. It seems, so said my friend the rector, that from the most ancient times those women who have bent the knee of demon gods, such as were the gods of Anahuac, were subject at any time to become possessed by them, even after they have abandoned their worship, and to be driven in their frenzy to the working of the greatest crimes. Thus, among other instances, he told me that a Greek poet named Theocritus sets out in one of his idols how a woman named Agave, being engaged in a secret religious orgy in honour of a demon named Dionysus, perceived her own son Pentheus watching the celebration of the mysteries, and thereon, becoming possessed by the demon, she fell on him and murdered him, being aided by the other women. For this the poet, who was also a worshipper of Dionysus, gave her great honour and not reproach, seeing that she did the deed at the behest of his god, a deed not to be blamed. Now I write of this for a reason, though it has nothing to do with me, for it seems that as Dionysus possessed Agave, driving her to unnatural murder, so did Huitzel possess Otomie, and indeed she said as much to me afterwards, for I am sure that if the devils whom the Greeks worshipped had such power, a still greater strength was given to those of Anuak, who among all fiends were the first. If this be so, as I believe, it was not Otomie that I saw at the rites of sacrifice, but rather the demon Huitzel, whom she once worshipped, and who had power, therefore, to enter into her body for a while in place of her own spirit. End of chapter 35 Recording by Patrick 79《Chapter Thirty Six of Montezuma's Daughter by H. Rider Haggard.
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter thirty six, the surrender. Taking Otomie in my hands, I bore her to one of the storehouses attached to the temple. Here many children had been placed for safety, and among them my own son. "'What ails our mother, father?' said the boy. "'And why did she shut me in here with these children, when it seems that there is fighting without?' "'Your mother has fainted,' I answered. "'And doubtless she placed you here to keep you safe.' now do you tender till i return i will do so answered the boy but surely it would be better that i who am almost a man should be without fighting the spaniards at your side rather than within nursing sick women do as i bid son i said and i charge you not to leave this place until i come for you again now I passed out of the storehouse, shutting the door behind me. A minute later I wished that I had stayed where I was, since on the platform my eyes were greeted by a sight more dreadful than any that had gone before. For there, advancing towards us, were the women divided into four great companies, some of them bearing infants in their arms. They came singing and leaping many of them naked to the middle nor was this all for in front of them ran the pabas and such of the women themselves as were persons in authority these leaders male and female ran and leaped and sang calling upon the names of their demon gods and celebrating the wickedness of their forefathers while after them poured the howling troops of women to and fro they rushed, now making obeisance to the statue of Huitzel, now prostrating themselves before the hideous sister, the goddess of death, who sat beside him, adorned with her carven necklace of men's skulls and hands, now bowing around the stone of sacrifice, and now thrusting their bare arms into the flames of the holy fire. For an hour or more they celebrated this ghastly carnival, of which even I, versed as I was in the Indian customs, could not fully understand the meaning, and then, as though some single impulse had possessed them, they withdrew to the centre of the open space, and forming themselves into a double circle, within which stood the pabas, of a sudden they burst into a chant so wild and shrill that as I listened my blood curdled in my veins. Even now the burden of that chant with the vision of those who sang it sometimes haunts my sleep at night, but I will not write it here. Let him who reads imagine all that is most cruel in the heart of man and every terror of the evilest dream, adding to these some horror-ridden tale of murder, ghosts, and inhuman vengeance. Then, if he can, let him shape the whole in words, and, as in a glass darkly, perchance he may mirror the spirit of that last ancient song of the women of the Otomi, with its sobs and cries of triumph, and its death wailings. Even as they sang, step by step they drew backwards, and with them went the leaders of each company, their eyes fixed upon the statues of their gods. Now they were but a segment of a circle, for they did not advance towards the temple. Backwards and outwards they went with a slow and solemn tramp. There was but one line of them now, for those in the second ring filled the gaps in the first as it widened. Still they drew on till at length they stood on the sheer edge of the platform. Then the priests and the women leaders took their place among them, and for a moment there was silence, until, at a signal, one and all, 
they bent them backwards. Standing thus, their long hair waving in the wind, the lights of burning houses flaring upon their breasts, and in their maddened eyes they burst into the cry of, Save us, sweet soul, receive us, Lord God, our home. Thrice they cried it, each time more shrilly than before. Then suddenly they were gone. The women of the Otomie were no more. With their own self-slaughter, they had consummated the last celebration of the rites of sacrifice that ever should be held in the city of pines. The devil gods were dead, and their worshippers with them. A low murmur ran round the lips of the men who watched. Then one cried, and his voice rang strangely in the sudden silence. May the wives, the women of the Otomy, rest softly in the houses of the sun. For of a surety they teach us how to die. Ay, I answered, but not thus. Let women do self-murder. Our foes have swords for the hearts of men. I turned to go, and before me stood Otomie. What has befallen? she said. Where are my sisters? Oh, surely I have dreamed an evil dream. I dream that the gods of my forefathers were strong once more, and that once more they drank the blood of men. Your ill dream has a worse awakening, Otomy, I answered. The gods of hell are still strong indeed in this accursed land, and they have taken your sisters into their keepings. Is it so? she whispered softly. Yet in my dream it seemed to me that this was their last strength, ere they sink into death unending. Look, look yonder! And she pointed towards the snowy crest of the Vulcan Jaca. I looked, but whether I saw the sight of which I am about to tell, or whether it was but an imagining born of the horrors of the most hideous night. In truth, I cannot say. At the least, I seemed to see this, and afterwards there were some among the Spaniards who swore that they had witnessed it also. On Jacques's lofty summit, now as always, stood a pillar of fiery smoke, and while I gazed, to my vision the smoke and the fire separated themselves. Out of the fire was fashioned a cross of flame that shone like lightning and stretched from many a rod across the heavens, its base resting upon the mountain top. At its foot rolled the clouds of smoke, and now these took forms vast and terrifying such forms indeed as those that sat in stone within the temple behind me but magnified a hundredfold see said otomie again the cross of your god shines above the shapes of mine the lost gods whom to-night i worship though not of my own will then she turned and went. For some few moments I stood, very much afraid, gazing upon the vision of Jacques's snow. Then suddenly the rays of the rising sun smote it, and it was gone. Now for three days more we held out against the Spaniards, for they could not come at us and their shot swept over our heads harmlessly. During these days I had no talk with Otomie, 
for we shrank from one another. Hour by hour she would sit in the storehouse of the temple, a very picture of desolation. Twice I tried to speak with her, my heart being moved to pity by the dumb torment in her eyes. But she turned her head from me and made no answer. Soon it came to the knowledge of the Spaniards that we had enough food and water upon the Teocli to enable us to live there for a month or more, and seeing that there was no hope of capturing the place by force of arms, they called a parley with us. I went down to the breach in the roadway, and spoke with her envoy, who stood upon the path below. At first the terms offered were that we should surrender at discretion. To this I answered that sooner than do so we would die where we were. Their reply was that if we would give over all who had taken part in any human sacrifice, the rest of us might go free. To this I said that the sacrifice had been carried out by women and some few men, and that all of these were dead by their own hands. They asked if Otomie was also dead. I told them no, but that I would never surrender unless they swore that neither she nor her son should be harmed, but rather that together, with myself, they should be given a safe conduct to go whither we willed. Oh, this they refused, but in the end I won the day, and a parchment was thrown up to me on the point of a lance. This parchment, which was signed by the Captain Bernal Diaz, set out that in consideration of the part that I and some men of the Otomie had played in rescuing the Spanish captives from death by sacrifice, a pardon was granted to me, my wife and child, and all upon the Teocli, with liberty to go whithersoever we would unharmed, our lands and wealth being, however, declared forfeit to the Viceroy. Well, with these terms I was well content. Indeed, I had never hoped to win any that would leave us our lives and liberty. And yet, for my part, death had been almost as welcome, for now Otomie had built a wall between us that I could never climb. And I was bound to her, to a woman who, willingly or no, had stained her hands with sacrifice. Well... My son was left to me, and with him I must be satisfied. At the least he knew nothing of his mother's shame. Oh, I thought to myself as I climbed the Teocalli, oh, that I could but escape far from this accursed land, and bear him with me to the English shores, I, and Otomie also, for there she might forget that once she had been a savage. Alas, it could scarcely be. Coming to the temple, I and those with me told the good tidings to our companions, who received it silently. Men of a white race would have rejoiced thus to escape, for when death is near all loss seems as nothing. But with these Indian people it is not so since when fortune frowns upon them, they do not cling to life. These men of the Otomie had lost their country, their wives, their wealth, their brethren, and their homes. Therefore life, with freedom to wander whither they would, seemed no great thing to them. So they met the boon that I had won from the mercy of our foes, as had matters gone otherwise they would have met the bane in sullen silence. I came to Otomie, and to her also I told the news. I had hoped to die where I am, she answered. But so be it. Death is always to be found. Only my son rejoiced, because he knew that God had saved us all from the death by sword or hunger. Father, he said, 
the Spaniards have given us life, but they take our country and drive us out of it. Well, where then shall we go? I do not know, my son, I answered. Father, the lad said again, let us leave this land of Anahuac, where there is nothing but Spaniards and sorrow. Let us find a ship and sail across the seas to England, our own country. Oh, the boy spoke my very thought, and my heart leapt at the words, though I had no plan to bring the matter about. I pondered a moment, looking at Otomie. The thought is good, Jew, she said, answering my unspoken question. For you and for our son there is no better. But for myself I will answer in the proverb of my people. The earth that bears us lies lightest on our bones. Then she turned, making ready to quit the storehouse of the temple where we had been lodged during the siege, and no more was said about the matter. Before the sun set, a weary throng of men, with some few women and children, were marching across the courtyard that surrounded the pyramid, for a bridge of timbers taken from the temple had been made over the breach in the roadway that wound about its side. At the gates the Spaniards were waiting to receive us. Some of them cursed us, some mocked, but those of the nobler sort said nothing for they pitied our flight and respected us for our courage we had shown in the last struggle. Their Indian allies were there also, and these grinned like unfed pumers, snarling and whimpering for our lives, till their masters kicked them to silence. The last act of the fall of Anahuac was as the first had been. Dog still ate dog, leaving the goodly spoil to the lion who watched. At the gates we were sorted out. The men, of small condition, together with the children, were taken from the ruined city by an escort, and turned loose upon the mountains, while those of note were brought to the Spanish camp to be questioned there before they were set free. I, with my wife and son, was led to the palace, our old home, there to learn the will of Captain Diaz. It is but a little way to go, and yet there was something to be seen in the path. For as we walked I looked up, and before me, standing with folded arms and apart from all men, was de Garcia. I had scarcely thought of him for some days, so full had my mind been of other matters. But at the sight of his evil face I remembered that while this man lived, sorrow and danger must be my bedfellows. He watched us pass, taking note of all. Then he called to me, who walked last. Farewell, cousin Wingfield. You have lived through this bout also, and won a free pardon, you, your woman, and your brat together. If the old war-horse, who is set over us as a captain, had listened to me, you should have been burned at the stake, every one of you. But so it is. Farewell for a while, friend. I am away to Mexico to report these matters to the Viceroy, who may have a word to say. I made no answer, but asked of our conductor, that same Spaniard whom I had saved from the sacrifice, what the senior meant by his words. This, Jew, that there has been a quarrel between our comrade Sarqueda and our captain. The former would have granted you no terms, or failing this would have decoyed you from your stronghold with false promises, and then have put you to the sword as infidels with whom no oath is binding. But the captain would not have it so, for he said that faith must be kept even with the heathen, 
and we whom you had saved cried shame on him. And so words ran high, and in the end the senior Sarkeda, who is a third in command among us, declared that he should have no party to his peacemaking, but would be gone to Mexico with his servants, there to report to the viceroy. Then the captain Diaz bade him be gone to hell if he wished, and report to the devil, saying that he had always believed that he had escaped thence by mistake, and they parted in wrath, who, since the day of Nostrist, never loved each other much. The end of it being that Sarkeda rides to Mexico within an hour, to make what mischief he can at the Viceroy's court, and I think that you are well rid of him. Father, said my son to me, who is that Spaniard who looks so cruelly upon us? Oh, that is he of whom I have told you, son, de Garcia, who has been the curse of our race for two generations, who betrayed your grandfather to the Holy Office and murdered your grandmother, who put me to torture and whose ill deeds are not done yet. Beware of him, son, now and ever, I beseech you. Now we will come to the palace, almost the only house that was left standing in the city of Pines. Here an apartment was made to us at the end of the long building, and presently a command was brought to us that I and my wife should wait upon the Spanish Captain Diaz. So we went, though Otomie desired to stay behind, leaving our son alone in the chamber where food had been brought to him. I remember that I kissed him before I left, though I don't know what moved me to do so, unless it was because I thought that he might be asleep when I returned. The Captain Diaz had his quarters at the other end of the palace, some two hundred paces away. Presently we stood before him. He was rough-looking, thick-set man, well on in years, with bright eyes and an ugly, honest face, like the face of a peasant who has toiled a lifetime in all weathers. Only the fields that Diaz tilled were fields of war, and his harvest had been the lives of men. Just then he was joking with some common soldiers in the strain scarcely suited to nice ears, but so soon as he saw us he ceased and came forward. I saluted him after the Indian fashion by touching the earth with my hand, for what was I but an Indian captive? "'Your sword,' he said briefly, as he scanned me with his quick eyes. I unbuckled it from my side, and handed it to him, saying in Spanish, Take it, Captain, for you have conquered, also it does come back to its owner. For this was the same sword that I had captured from one Bernal Diaz in the fray of Nostrist. He looked at it, then swore a great oath, and said, I thought it could be no other man and so we meet again thus after so many years. Well, you gave me my life once, and I am glad that I have lived to pay the debt. Had I not been sure it was you, you had not won such easy terms, friend. How are you named? Nay, I know what the Indians call you. I am named Wingfield. Friend Wingfield, then, for I tell you that I would have set beneath yonder devil's house, and he nodded towards the Teocli, till you starved upon its top. Nay, friend Wingfield, take back the sword. I suited myself with another many years ago, and you have used this one gallantly. Never have I seen Indians take a better fight. And so, that is Otomie, Montezuma's daughter, and your wife. Still handsome and loyal, I see. 
Lord, Lord, it is many years ago, and yet it seems but yesterday that I saw her father die. A Christian-hearted man, though no Christian, and one whom we dealt ill with. May God forgive us all. Well, madam, none can say that you have a Christian heart. If a certain tale that I have heard of what passed yonder some three nights since is true. But we will speak no more of it, for the savage blood will show. And you are pardoned for your husband's sake, who saved my comrades from the sacrifice. To all this Otomie listened, standing like a statue, but she never answered a word. Indeed, she had spoken very rarely since that dreadful night of her unspeakable shame. "'And now, friend Wingfield,' went on Captain Diaz, "'what is your purpose? You are free to go where you will. Whither then will you go?' "'I do not know,' I answered. "'Years ago, when the Aztec Emperor gave my life,' and this princess, my wife, in marriage, I swore to be faithful to him and his cause, and to fight for them till Popo ceased to vomit smoke, till there was no king in Tenochtitlan, and the people of Anahuac were no more a people. Then you are quit of your oath, friend, for all these things have come about, and there has been no smoke on Popper for these two years. Now, if you will be advised by me, you will turn Christian again, and enter the service of Spain. But come, let us supper. We can talk of these matters afterwards. So we sat down to eat by the light of torches, in the banqueting hall with Bernal Diaz and some other of the Spaniards. Otomie would have left us, and though the captain bade her stay, she ate nothing, and presently slipped away from the chamber. End of chapter 36 Recording by Patrick 79